Welcome to the 10th lecture here on uh, the Biblical Evangelist. I'm Tim Robnett, uh, leading our time of learning through the scriptures. We began in the book of Genesis and have tried to develop uh, from Old to New Testament uh, some of the major teachings uh, about evangelism, uh, a God who's created us, people who are created in the image and likeness of God, people who have rebelled, and because of that, in Genesis 5, it says that we're created now in the image of Adam, which I believe emphasizes our, we call fallen nature, our sinfulness, our propensity to be self-centered and uh, go our own way and be indifferent to God or rebellious to God. But the scriptures goes on to tell us that God has provided a way back into a relationship with him. And that provision comes through a savior who conquers Satan, but also gives his life as a ransom for many. And uh, we see this developed in the, in the book of Psalms and the need of forgiveness, the need of restoration, the need to uh, get rid of, deal with sin and shame and guilt and an unforgiving heart and uh, return to God to know forgiveness and love, to live with joy and purpose in life. Uh, this is God's desire, that we live with him, that we know him, that we fellowship with him. One of the Psalms that uh, uh, highlights this is uh, Psalm chapter uh, 27, that when we delight ourselves in the Lord, he gives us the desire of our heart. It's about a relationship, a relationship with God. Life is about a relationship with God, broken by sin, restored by Christ. And in this life, it says that God will give us a desire of our heart as we delight in him, as we know him, as we pursue him. He fashions our heart after his own. We're coming now to the end of those lectures, going through the New Testament and seeing that Jesus came, the Emmanuel, God with us, seeing his atoning sacrifice on the cross, seeing his resurrection from the dead. We come to the life of the church. And after the resurrection, after the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, the church began to spread a message. And this really is the essence of evangelism, good news. Good news proclaimed, good news shared, good news uh, sung about. <laughs> and the second chapter of Acts, uh, it concludes in summary, uh, after the day of Pentecost, just 50 days after the ascension of Jesus Christ, uh, these words in Acts 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Everyone was filled with awe, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. So, yes, they were proclaiming the gospel, but the life of the community was very special, very unique. It was different. It was notably, markedly different than the communities within which it was born, within Judaism. Uh, this community of love, of sharing, of the mighty acts of God happening in a normal process, a normal way. And people were awestruck by the presence of God. And we know that came because Jesus had given forth the Spirit. And they, they were baptized in the Spirit as the Spirit uh, displayed uh, His presence with the tongues of fire on their heads but words spoken in known languages praising God to people that hadn't learned those languages. This was a sign unto the people of God's presence, of the work of God, of the authenticity of this message which they preached. But it was more than a message preached. It was a life experience of a community. 
not just of one or two, but of thousands of people. And this life characterized by giving, by an awe, a presence of God, by loving one another, by caring for one another, by including uh, all people, not just one ethnic group. And as we would read on in Acts, you will see that as problems arise, arose in the church, and they did, the apostles, uh, praying and depending on God, solved the problems. As we find just after this, the, uh, in, in chapter 6 of Acts, the uh, e unequal distribution of food. Uh, uh, again, it's, it's a prejudice against the Hellenistic Jews. Yes, there was a problem. Yes, there was sin. But they work to solve the problem and meet the needs of the people. So what we have described here is what Paul later, I think, wrote in Philemon 6, where the early versions of the NIV translate Philemon 6 is this, that, uh, and we pray for you. I pray for you, Paul said, that you will be active in sharing your faith so that you may come to a full knowledge of everything that we have in Christ. And in that translation, it connects evangelism with the fullness of the experience of Christ in individual lives and in community. And the, the fuller understanding of the life of Christ, the life of God, this eternal life, is a product of regularly and spontaneously and with real joy sharing the good news of Jesus, who Jesus is and what he has done, that we could be born again, that we can be saved, we can be delivered from sin and death and fear of eternal judgment. All of those things are removed as we put our faith in Jesus Christ. So this good news had an impact. And the impact in the lives of people in the community also had an impact on others believing what they were preaching, what they were proclaiming. It was a living illustration of what is it to know Christ personally? What is it to have the fullness of the Spirit of Christ in their lives? So evangelism proceeding from the, the very first days of the church is connected with, not disconnected with, it is related to, in, in a, uh, uh, in, in, as where one plus one equals one, that is the gospel and a loving community equals more people believing in Christ and uh, the awe of God being seen, the church of Jesus Christ growing. So evangelism is the clear preaching proclamation of the gospel, but it is enhanced. It is uh, uh, believable when people see what is the outcome of believing in Christ. And what we have in the New Testament is a loving community. I would suggest to you that um, as we think about the community of the church today, there are at least uh, three concepts that we need to think about as a healthy church. That out of this healthy church, out of this community of faith, uh, more evangelism happens, uh, even acceleration of evangelism. And I would say, too, when we don't find these things, you don't see evangelism, the proclamation of the gospel, resulting in people believing. You may have proclamation, but you're not have people believing. The elements of this healthy church, I believe, first of all, are worship. And uh, take your Bibles, as it were, and look at John 4 again, uh, at the woman at the well, John chapter 4. And uh, as Jesus was uh, communicating what it was to have this living water, this eternal uh, eternal life with him, uh, he spoke to uh, the, the Samaritan woman in this way. Yet a time is coming, verse 23 of John 4, and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. So even here in the presentation of Jesus as the Messiah, as Jesus as a, a, a spring, a wellspring of water springing up within this lady, giving eternal life. Uh, it is connected with being a worshiper, 
a worshiper, one who has eternal life, is worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth, not just in uh, religious forms or in routine or saying the right words or observing the right days. It's communicated as eternal life is communicated as an active uh, life of worshiping God the Father. In fact, it says the Father is seeking worshipers, those that would give their lives fully to him, that would fully obey him, would fully uh, exalt him and, and be enthralled by uh, his life, the very life of God. God is spirit and worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So this early church the, uh, or any of the church that really salvation opens the door that we can truly be worshipers that honor God and that we're not false worshipers. We're not doing some false kind of religion, but it's of our spirit and from our spirit and with the spirit of God that we can be worshipers of God. A healthy church is a church that's celebrating God, that's worshiping God, that's obeying God, that's uh, 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 seeking God in every way. Also, we find in John uh, chapter 13, another dimension of what a healthy church is and a church that really is contagious, a, a church that's attractive and makes the gospel attractive. In John chapter 13, verse 34 uh, and 35 reads in this way, and Jesus speaking again in the upper room the night before his crucifixion, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Uh, uh, this is a very unique mark of the Christian community, uh, the mark of true sacrificial uh, love, caring about God, about others more than one cares about themselves not being narcissistic, not being self-oriented, but being a giving community, community where others think about others, community where people are concerned about others' welfare, uh, where the church is a giving church, uh, not, not a taking, not absorbing uh, praise or trying to get accolades for themselves, but people who give, give to one another, sacrificially caring about uh, one another, focused on relationships, concerned about people's spiritual health, about their physical health, about their well-being. Uh, a true mark of uh, this community is loving relationships. And uh, this is, uh, again, an application of what Philemon said. I pray that you will have be active in sharing your faith, that you will come to a full understanding of everything you have in Christ. And what we have in Christ is an authentic, a genuine community of people loving people. Church is not about programs, though it may have programs. Church is not about uh, certain experiences, though we do have experiences. Uh, the church here, as Jesus said, is a community of those who love one another. So uh, the issue that I'm talking about here is the healthy church the dynamic of loving relationships, the dynamic of worship of God makes a difference in evangelistic impact. Either it's going to happen or it's not going to happen, but it's directly related to the quality of life of that community. It's not disjunct from that. And that's uh, what we found also in Acts 67, uh, really from the Old Testament. We read in Acts 67, verse 1 to 3, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all peoples. So here it connects the impact of God's ways being known and understand on all the earth. It goes on to talk about to all the nations because God's favor shines upon people. That is, God's love, God's character is seen, God's character is experienced in the life of the community. Uh, older and younger, different ethnicities, that uh, there is real love in, in the church of God. There is the, 
the um, salvation that we declare we have, being forgiven, living forgiven lives, uh, makes a difference. The life of the community, the true love of God being seen in human relationships uh, makes a difference. And that's uh, what we have just read in Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2, as uh, we've already pointed out, there was this quality of, of life that uh, was very attractive, was irresistible, was uh, making a huge impact in, in the community of the early church. Now, the early church, uh, as it gathered to worship, uh, they met in homes. It says that here. Uh, they broke bread from house to house. Uh, but uh, I believe even the day of Pentecost and the, the gathering of the community of Christ was on the Temple Mount uh, in the colonnade, we call Solomon's Colonnade, in the court uh, there, courtyard around the temple where many groups would gather uh, because there were many different rabbis teaching. And uh, as I've been to Israel and been on the Temple Mount, as they explain how worship happened, how uh, rabbis taught there, I believe that community was gathered there, uh, not in the temple, but in the courts of the temple. And uh, there they were hearing the apostles' teaching. And uh, even in Acts 2, when Peter began to explain because of the tongues of fire that had come down upon the church, they were in a very public place. That is for the people had gathered, the Jewish people had gathered to worship. And they visibly could see these tongues of fire. They heard the language, these variety, over 12 different languages are mentioned here, that uh, the uh, early disciples were praising God in these languages they hadn't learned. And so the church wasn't isolated in some uh, apartment or some house uh, somewhere hidden away. It was a very public setting. And there were other uh, worshipers there, Jewish people who had not yet believed in Christ. But the church continued to gather there this wasn't just one time they did this. This is where they came for teaching. This is where they came to remember the resurrection. They also broke bread and house to house, but they gathered, I believe, there in the Temple Mount. And they were listening to the apostles' teaching, as well as everyone else, even those who hadn't believed. They were hearing the message of the gospel. And they were also selling their properties. They were meeting all the needs of people, uh, and they were praising God. They were worshiping God uh, regularly, daily. Uh, and they found, it says, favor with the people. How did they find favor with the people? Because they were among the people. They weren't isolated, as we think, in a church building somewhere. They were in a public setting, more like a town square, uh, we might say, as they gathered to worship the Lord. So uh, their experience of worship their experience of loving one another, uh, their experience of seeing, hearing the teachings of Scripture, seeing miracles. This was common. <laughs> this wasn't unordinary. This was the norm of the life of the community. And it grew from 120 just uh, on the day of uh, Pentecost to thousands uh, within a week or so that these gatherings went on. And it was quite a stir in the city of Jerusalem. But my point here is that the body life, the community life, the relationships of the believers with God and with one another was very evident. There was love. There was meeting the needs of people. There was prayer. There was rejoicing. There were signs and wonders. And uh, that dynamic uh, is something that we need, as we think about evangelism today, To uh, we can't ignore it. If people can't see the change of life in the community of Christ, then why believe what we say? If we say one thing and yet we don't believe, I don't. people don't see it uh, in our relationships, why would they believe? John Stott, uh, the uh, Anglican uh, uh, teacher and, and pastor, writes in his book on Psalm 67, his favorite psalms, this paragraph, and let me read it to you. Non-Christian people are watching us. We claim to know, to love, and to follow Jesus Christ. We say that he is our Savior, our Lord, our friend. 
What difference does he make to these Christians? The world asks searchingly. Where is their God? It may be said without fear of contradiction that the greatest hindrance to evangelism in the world today is the failure of the church to supply evidence in her own life and work of the saving power of God. Rightly may we pray for ourselves that we may have God's blessing and mercy and the light of his countenance not that we may have uh, that we may monopolize his grace and bask in the sunshine of his favor but that others may see in us his blessing and his beauty and be drawn to him through us that's the major uh, thrust of this lecture as we think about evangelism and the life of the church the body life these are related community life what's happening in the local church directly impacts our ability to uh, effectively communicate the gospel and for p people to seriously consider their own relationship with jesus christ so uh, let's uh, highlight again some of these marks in the community and we've already talked about talked about one and as we read in john 13 34 and 35 a new commandment jesus said i give you love one another just as i have loved you um, it's a a new kind of love a, a love that is unconditional love a love that's not based on whether you love me back or not uh, a love that's based on the fact god has loved us god has given his one and only son for us and because of that evident love for us for god we also love other people and uh, that means that the church has to be very cautious about uh, our criticisms of the world. Certainly, we don't agree with all the, uh, the sin and the, the rebellion and the lawlessness that goes on in the world today, the ugliness, the, the bullying, the accusing that goes on. But we do have to communicate clearly that God loves every person. And we know that because the Bible says God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. Uh, we often think of the cru crucifixion of Christ and the, the, the two thieves that were hung on each side of Jesus. They both laughed. They both mocked at him. But obviously as one of them hung there and kept looking at Jesus, he, he was transformed by Christ himself. And he asked for the mercy of God to be shown to him. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Only God knows the condition of a heart, the attitude, the, the responsiveness of a heart. But this loving God saved and, and brought to eternal life this criminal that hung next to Jesus Christ. The other man continued to reject and curse Christ. But this person asked for mercy and he got it. God is always responsive to a broken heart. People are humble. People who seek him. Why? Because God is a loving God. He communicates his love from the day of creation uh, to the day of his second coming. He, the, Peter says God doesn't want anyone to perish, but to everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. So uh, we need to remember the mark of the attractive community is the mark of love, of loving people, even though they're different, even though they're sinful, that we, we hold out to them the mercy of God, the grace of God. Now they must receive that. They must call on the name of the Lord. They must repent of their sins. But we need to be a loving community toward the world and toward one another, uh, that we need to be forgiving just as in Christ, God forgave us, Ephesians 5.32. So the church, to be attractive in terms of the gospel, in terms of persuading, in terms of uh, helping people to consider that Christ is the Savior of the world and that he will forgive their sins, that he will forgive them to eternal life, that we need to major on being a loving community and really actively everyone participating in the love of God uh, in John chapter 17 Jesus uh, 
The night, again, uh, same setting the night before his crucifixion, not in the upper room, but uh, no doubt in the garden, uh, prayed this prayer in John chapter 17 and uh, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. He was referring to his disciples. He said, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Um, Another, in in one sense, uh, exhortation, another teaching, but also warning. Uh, The church divided, the church that has a critical spirit, the church, uh, local churches are people that are always criticizing others. Um, I'm not sure that that's going to be persuasive in, in, in believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed here that the church would be one. Now, we know that we have a great example of uh, unity in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We know they are three persons. They are three distinct persons. Uh, They have uh, distinct functions uh, within the work of creation and the work of sustaining the world and the work of redemption. The Bible lays out their uniquenesses as persons, but yet God is one, one in character, Uh, one in attitude, one in purpose, uh, that the Trinity works in harmony, though there is distinction. And uh, I believe that's what comes here in Jesus' prayer. Father, may they be one. That is the church. May they be one in purpose. May they be one in worship. May they be one in gospel preaching. Though that we're very different in cultures, We've all probably been to various cultures, various communities of faith. The expressions of worship are very different. Music is very different. Some people use instruments, some do not. Some people dance, some people do not. But though we're different, we're still worshiping God. And in the body of Christ, uh, in any given geographical area, if there is not unity, there is not evangelism. And uh, we had a great example of a former president of Multnomah Seminary and Bible College, now university, Dr. Joe Aldrich, who back in the 70s and the 80s asked that question. How is it that in a geographical location, and by saying that, he said, how is it when Christians live in in, in the same place can this unity be experienced? Uh, How can this unity be experienced so that there will be a sustained evangelistic impact of the church? That is, as the church preaches the gospel, people will believe. And uh, Dr. Joe's answer was the church uh, leaders must live in unity with one another. We don't have the same church name. We don't have the same church traditions. We don't have the same practices of worship. But there can be a spirit of unity and there can be purposeful activities of unity that demonstrate to the world that Jesus truly is God the Son. And uh, we know that's in spirit and truth. And and we know that this unity is is not created when Christians are bashing one another, criticizing one another. Now, certainly we need to stand for truth and preach the truth of Scripture. But uh, we, we don't need to create unnecessary division. And we need to seek those places and those ways that we can stand together and work together. Uh, this is a big challenge, but it's one that I think history demonstrates very clearly that when the church is working together, when the church is praying together, when the church, and that by that I mean churches in a local area, seek ways of service together, when the churches honor one another, when the churches speak well of one another, that there is a redemptive 
a, a movement of the Spirit of God as the gospel is preached. Uh, so many people are, are not open to the gospel because of the way Christians live, uh, how they treat one another, how they treat other people. But Jesus said, uh, Lord, may they be one, even as we are one, that the world may believe that you sent me. And so he is very clearly relating the fact of the, the, the persuasiveness uh, of the gospel in people's heart to, to woo them to Christ is related to how they treat one another. So there is an attitude. There are words. There are actions that create lo- that uh, out of love create unity. In Romans chapter 15 verse 7 to 9, we read these words, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and I will sing praise of your name. So here the emphasis to the Roman Christians for Paul is accept one another, whether Jew or Gentile. Uh, Be uh, gracious, be open, be kind. Uh, Engage with uh, other people. minimize, minimize criticism. Uh, If you have nothing good to say, don't say it. Obviously, we stand for truth and we clarify error in all situations. But there must be this overwhelming spirit of acceptance, of kindness. Because as just as God has accepted us in Christ, it's not because of our goodness, it's because of His grace and all that Christ has done. So, uh, As you listen to this, there is a message to the church. If the church, if a local congregation, if a community of churches want to see others coming to Christ, then we have to devote ourselves to accepting one another, loving one another, working together, supporting each other, being kind and gracious to one another. That the actual redemptive life that we preach is that we're living it. That people find acceptance. Even though they're sinners, they find acceptance. They find grace. They find compassion in listening people. They don't find people that condone their sin, but they don't find people that condemn them because they're sinners. But present to them, in word and deed, uh, the gospel of our Lord and Savior. Some years ago, I was uh, doing some uh, consulting, actually, with some churches in a, a given area. And uh, there was conflict uh, in a particular church, and uh, that church split and um, created actually more than one church within a community. But uh, it was observed by the leaders that as that fragmentation of the church would ha- was happening, that uh, people in the community's response to the gospel stopped. And uh, over time, it convicted the people that had split from the church that had broken apart. And actually, by the grace of God, the church came back together as one, as it had originally been one. And the criticism stops, reconciliation happened. And noticeably, what happened also was that people began to Uh, give their hearts to Christ. As the gospel was preached, people began to believe and respond to the gospel of our Lord and Savior. So uh, that's just a personal (laughs) experience that I have had and uh, seeing that division versus unity and versus compromise. I mean, uh, comparing uh, and and fractions happening when there is unity and forgiveness that it is directly related to the fruitfulness of uh, proclamation evangelism. So, uh, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. We find also in Acts, um, the, um, as we've already read in Acts 2, that it says, 
And the Lord added, the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. The Lord added, not not people added, the Lord added to their number uh, on a regular, consistent basis uh, because of the conduct and the life of the early church. It was a daily experience. It wasn't something that was... Uh, you know, just periodic. It was regularly, it was regularly happening, um, and we. What was regularly happening was this divine action of salvation, of uh, convincing people that they do need the Lord, and in the Lord is salvation, because people not only saw it, uh, not only heard it, but they saw it in the lives of their friends and family members. Um, I know in uh, the joy of, of pastoring a church and living in that community context and seeing friends and family members come to faith in Christ. And uh, I have seen with my own eyes, I've baptized individuals. Uh, basically, their story was this, that I saw the change, not just in my family, but in this community. This community is different. That these people are real people. They're authentic. They're genuine. And in a sense, they're saying, I want what you have. And again, it was, an, uh, I would hope, credit to my great preaching. And hopefully that had something to do with it. But what was persuasive was the love and the forgiveness and the, and the realness of the Christian people. That they had problems, but they had a Lord. They prayed prayers, God answered those prayers. Uh, there was a kindness, a faithfulness about people's lives. So um, the New Testament is very clear uh, that the life of the community, of the local church, directly impacts evangelistic ministry uh, for good or bad. And uh, we find that also in Acts chapter 16, in a story of not just one individual believing, but a whole household. And it, we know as the story of uh, the Philippian, uh, Philippian jailer. And um, we know that Paul and Silas were put in prison and they had been ministering in the city. Um, and uh, they were in chains. Um, but then um, there was an earthquake that shook the prison about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a very violent earthquake that the foundation of the prisons were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because what he had happened, what had come to believe, he, he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So we see this, what is often called the oikos, which is household in, in Greek. Uh, language uh, that it's not just individuals it, it is even households who can believe because they see they see the power here obviously of the earthquake they hear the message of Christ and of the apostles declaring the Christ but the impact of the of the gospel uh, here was not just to an, an individual but hold household not to just one generation but to multiple generations. And uh, uh, 
you know, again, we, we see this in the life of the church where sometimes, and, and I've seen this in youth ministry, where teenagers are attracted to the gospel, they come to Christ, and then they begin to share that with their family, and their family comes to Christ. I've seen it in the other way. Uh, I've seen it where uh, adults, uh, couples, uh, maybe because of marriage problems or whatever, they come, they're, they see the love of the church, they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, thinking of one family particularly, and in a, in a way, the father was dramatically converted, but then that affected his whole household, his sons and his, his brothers and uh, others of an extended family. Uh, so uh, a loving community not just reaches an individual, but they reach an individual who has a network of those who have not yet believed. And what happens in one life begins to touch other lives. Maybe not immediately, maybe it's over a year or two or several years of time. But the, the scriptures, again, the power of the gospel preached and seen in community can affect multi-generations within a short period of time that whole households uh, can come to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, as we think of the, the church, we, we think of the impact of these loving relationships. We think of the impact of the gospel preached. We think of the impact on individuals and upon family units, whether it's through a child that reaches into a family, whether it's a teenager that reaches into a family, whether it's an adult that reaches down to their family. Uh, think of a man that years ago was a city official and yeah, actually came into uh, my office at, at the church, not on a Sunday, and I explained the gospel to him, and he began to bring his, his uh, family to church, and his whole family eventually, within a short period of time, came to Christ uh, because of the gospel, because of the context of a loving, uh, supportive church. Um, but we also find within the context of the body, uh, there are are different people, different styles, as it were, of the Christian life, uh, different personalities, different spiritual gifts, uh, different ways of communicating the gospel. Um, you know, one thing we need to realize, we need many ways of showing the life of Christ, uh, many ways of explaining the gospel, because there are many personalities, many people of different experience, I don't relate to all people. All people don't relate to me. But the uniqueness of the body of Christ as God has designed it allows uh, uh, the whole body of Christ to be effective witnesses. And that's what it said in Acts 1.8. You, all of you, will be my witnesses. Um, I remember a story of my grandmother that uh, one of the pastors she had uh, loved to bake pies. This was a number of years ago. And his way of kind of visiting people in the community and, and in a sense being evangelistic was he would bake a pie and take it to people and introduce himself, introduce the church and leave the people with a, with a, a pie. Uh, that might sound corny and maybe it is, but, you know, his style. Um, I have other people that have very uh, unique ministries and uh, lifestyles and things that they're interested in. Some people are very quiet. Um, there was a lady that served in the church I pastored years ago, an older lady, actually in her 80s. Uh, a very quiet lady, but very social. Love people, love to talk to people. And, uh, you know, if, if you really didn't know her personally, you would think, well, she, you know, maybe she's a Christian, but she must not have much of an impact. Well, she had a tremendous impact. Uh, because she was a great conversationalist, very quiet. And uh, in time, as I was pastor, uh, she uh, asked me if uh, she could help me out some way. And I said, yeah, I'm trying to have this pastor's class, just people who visit the church come. And over a few weeks, I can explain to them the vision of the church, the purpose of the church, how they get to know them. Over a number of years, she literally brought hundreds of people into that class. And, and I was astonished. In fact, I wasn't thinking about it much at the time, but a few years later, I began to count backwards and realized how many, and it is hundreds of people, 
she, uh, uh, as it were, recruited for the pastor's class. Quiet, older lady, you would think, oh, how, did, how could she serve God? Well, she did very, <laughs> very abundantly serve the Lord. So uh, a number of years ago, uh, a pastor by, name, by the name of Bill Hybels wrote a book about uh, evangelistic styles, styles. And uh, I think it's something very important because it describes to us the necessity of different personalities, different gifts, different ways that people do life, do ministry, and that we need as a church to be very encouraging and accepting because people don't all do evangelism in the same way. And so he gives these, and you can think of them with me and go study them yourself, but he labels, for example, the Apostle Peter as a confrontationalist. You know, he's one out preaching on the streets, and we see that in Acts. He's preaching great sermons. He's very confrontational. I mean, he uses in his sermon, you Jews have killed the author of life. I mean, that's pretty confrontational, isn't it? Like, you know, you put Jesus on the cross. You're the ones that killed the, the author of life. And we find him saying that in Acts 2. In Acts 4. So Peter, in his style, was very blunt, very bold in the way he went about things. And we know people like that today. We know some people, you know, in their gospel presentation or in their, they're always opinionated, you know, they always have their views. And God uses people like that. Another example is the Apostle Paul, who is labeled here in this book as uh, an intellectual. And I think of the times that he was in Athens in Acts 17 and how he observed the various philosophers and teachers. And it seems that he dialogued. In fact, the word dialogue is used in Acts 17, trying to listen, to understand, to get the worldview, as it were, of these different uh, religions. And um, then he has the famous line, obviously, in his sermon that um, about... Uh, I, see, I observe, Paul said, I observe in your city that you have many gods. And you even have one labeled the unknown God. And so this unknown God uh, that you have labeled is, I guess it's just a category. If there's something we forgot or we don't know, let's, let's give one the name of the unknown God. He says, of that unknown God, I come to declare to you who he is. And therefore he preached Christ and explained to him Christ. So th there are those in life, and maybe you're this way, maybe you're more philosophical, analytical, intellectual, and you like to debate or even talk or consider ideas and the implications of those ideas. And you want to present Christ in the context of, of global ideas or world religions. And uh, people are that way. We need those people. We need people to explain to us uh, like in the United States of America, obviously, in the last four or five years, the whole issue of being woke. What is woke? What does that mean? Where did that come from? Uh, well, it came from sociology. It came from uh, some history, but really studying groups of people and how one group supposedly oppresses another group. And it became, a, in a sense, a worldview. This is how you interpret life through how people have treated people through the ages. And you need to define justice and social justice and equity and all of these terms. Uh, so we need to understand. We need to be able to dialogue with them and e explain, uh, well, really, theologically, we're all creating the image of God. Everybody is equal. Everybody has equal potential, equal uh, status in the eyes of God. All are loved by God. Are all treated the same way? No. No. Uh, <laughs> Well, life is not fair. Life is certainly not fair. We're also all sinners. All have fallen short of the glory of God, everyone. So uh, we, we have intellectual discourse, and some people more than others. So in the body of Christ, where we argue for love and acceptance and getting on with each other and forgiving each other, we find difference, different personalities, different styles of communication. And God uses these different styles to bring people to Christ himself, to communicate the gospel in certain ways. Um, we have the story in John 5 of the blind man that Jesus heals. And uh, 
in that story, um, you know, uh, after he sees, he's examined by the Jewish uh, leaders there, and they want to know, well, what happened to you, and how did it happen, and who did this? And uh, in the end of the day, he basically says to the Jewish leaders, all I know is this, once I was blind, but now I see. And we consider that a testimony. It is. It's his own experience. And that is valid. It is certainly valid for him. It is irrefutable. You can't refute what his experience was to him. And he was blind, and now he sees. And as communicators of the gospel, we all should have our own story, our testimony. What happened to us? What have we experienced with Christ? And so... Uh, there are various styles of communication, various styles of evangelism. There can be the confrontational. There can be the intellectual, the apologetic. There can be the testimonial. And uh, I had the privilege to work with uh, Dr. Luce Plough for 20 years. Always loved his sermons. And uh, one of the reasons I loved his messages because they were filled with stories about people people that he had basically encountered, sometimes stories that he'd heard about other people, but they're mostly stories about people that he knew and uh, how they had met Christ or the situations they had gone through or how he had ministered to them and how he had shared the gospel with them and how they had responded. And we call that testimonial, giving evidence as were of the experience of certain people. And... Um, we have that as a style. So in the body of Christ, and this lecture is about the, the, the body of Christ and the body, the church, the local church, the churches, the individual believers, our impact in evangelism, first of all, is greatly affected by our love quotient. Do we love as Christ loved us? Our unity factor. Are we a person that's cooperating, that's, that's uh, willing to work with others, that's supporting others, that's learning how, uh, that's willing to uh, work with other people and, and creating the unity, the, the purposeful unity that God would want us to have in Christ Jesus. Getting along, <laughs> encouraging, affirming other people. And uh, also uh, that um, Secondly here, the, the major point is that we are all different. <laughs> In this unity, uh, there is diversity. Diversity of personality, diversity of spiritual gift, diversity of experience. And so we're suggesting that there's different styles, as it were, of witness. Peter the confrontationalist, Paul the intellectual, uh, the blind man, testimonial. Uh, what, what's your style? I, I'm even suggesting to you that Luis Palau, a wonderful evangelist, preached to millions of people. He used testimony in a, an amazing way. Testimony of his father coming to Christ. He told that hundreds, if not thousands of times. There is power in testimony. There is power in intellectual discourse. There is power in presentation, proclaiming truth for truth is what it is. Another um, is... Uh, what is called the Matthew style, the interpersonal style, uh, where Jesus basically asks Matthew, uh, I like to, the tax collector, I like to go to your house today and, and have a meal. And uh, we think of that in the gospel account where Matthew was overjoyed that Jesus invited him to uh, ask him that he could come to his house. And Matthew invited him. And so they had a dinner, they had a meal uh, uh, with tax collectors and sinners at Matthew's house. And the picture that we have there of communication uh, uh, is dialogue uh, around a table, having discussion, uh, being open, you know, eating together, fellowship together. Uh, some people are very, we call social, very relational people. They love to be with people. They love conversations. They love listening. Not just talking, but asking uh, important questions, asking questions to get to know one another, to share one another's life, to learn people's opinions, experiences, viewpoints. 
And uh, there is joy in, in relationship. I mean, we are created as social beings. The Trinity is social, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternally in relationship, constantly communicating uh, uh, in harmony and supporting one another. So relationships, uh, interpersonal relationships are, uh, say we say, a style, a style of communicating the gospel. And uh, probably Campus Crusades, uh, Four Spiritual Laws, Billy Graham, Step to Peace with God, and uh, other forms of interpersonal communication uh, uh, is a great way of sharing the gospel. We see that with Jesus and Nicodemus. We see that Jesus and the woman at the well. But here we see with Jesus and Matthew around a table, listening as well as communicating uh, thoughts and ideas. Uh, one of the th very important things for the church uh, in, in our life uh, of witness in the world is the church needs to learn to listen. By that, I mean all Christians. We need to learn to ask good questions. It doesn't mean we agree with the answers. But in asking questions, um, we uh, hopefully respect the person we're talking to. We, we highly regard them. We hopefully, out of a genuine heart, we actually do want to know what they believe, what they think, what they feel. That we treat them as human beings, not just as objects or someone that's, you know, going to sign their name on a decision card. We want to communicate the message of Christ, and that is a message of relationship, a message of love. And therefore, we should have the decency and the respect to listen. What do people believe? What are their dreams, their aspirations, their pains, their disappointments in life. Um, I, uh, a few years ago when we're having uh, such a process uh, here in Portland of uh, uh, social upheaval and uh, riots and all kinds of things, I was trying to minister to some of the homeless people. And uh, one of the questions I ask some of these homeless men that I was dialoguing with at the time in our city here, Portland, Oregon, is, uh, you know, what, what are some of the greatest experiences of life? And I was surprised because they were homeless and not living in their family. But every one of those men answered the question, the most uh, happy or joyful memory of life was in the context of a relationship with a parent, with a child, with a grandchild. It was always uh, the social dimension. Uh, uh, one uh, young man I, who was adopted, uh, his story was the greatest joy for him in life was that the joy he brought to his father when his father adopted him and that his father could truly say, that he had a son. Uh, another uh, style of evangelism is the woman at the well, which is very invitational, where she went after dialoguing with Jesus and said, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. And another style is the style of Dorcas in the book of Acts, as one who serves, caring for, meeting the needs of other people. Well, as we think of the church, we think of the church in love, in relationship, hopefully in various styles of communicating the gospel. But we, we cannot forget that the book of Revelation ends with this uh, quote in Revelation twenty two seventeen: The spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. And all the gospel uh, story, all the illustrations of what it is to be redeemed and restored to God, we can never forget there is no good news without an invitation. And it's the church of Jesus Christ, every individual believer, every preacher that has the opportunity to invite people that today you can begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. The good news is for you that today you can begin a relationship with Jesus Christ and have the gift of eternal life. Thank you.